Welcome back everyone, it's me Matsmus, and thank you so much for being here today. We are discussing unmanned ground vehicles and how they're being utilised across the world in different military forces. Now as you can see, these Germans are about to absolutely annihilate this town with conventional vehicles, weapons and troops on the ground. But more and more, we're starting to see around the world, forces are transitioning to trying to use drones. Now we all know that the Air Force is very heavily occupied with its drone technology, and that's not saying that unmanned ground vehicles haven't been getting much attention, but they really just haven't been capitalised or utilised much within the ground forces yet because there's still a long way to go. We've all seen those videos of the robots trying to open doors and falling over, it looks absolutely hilarious. Bruh. However, when it comes to being used in a military application, robots and drones really have a lot more problems to deal with. And that's why it's fascinating to me to learn of the different systems and the kind of applications that these things can be put under. Whether it be casualty evacuation, obstacle clearing, mine clearing, there's a ton of different options that can be available. And I personally feel like we're going to see these robots and these UGVs working alongside us a lot more in the near future. And that's pretty cool to see. However, there are some vehicles out there that are a little yeah, skeptical and makes you think, is this really something that's going to be applicable to what we need? Is it going to be worth the money? Is it going to be worth the hassle of trying to bring this thing along with us? It's hard to say, you know, I, I've never been in service with one of these things. I would love to try. I would love to have a 50 caliber machine gun on top of a tracked vehicle following me behind that's being remote controlled by someone. But uh, it all makes you wonder what happens if this thing, you know, breaks down, it's got sensitive equipment on it, you've got to carry the 50 cal out of there, you've got to deny the vehicle if you don't want it captured, etc, etc. So there's a lot more to it than just bringing a drone along. Um, and I find overall, though, it's going to be a really good benefit, but I think there's some situations where these things are actually going to be more of a hindrance. The idea behind these kind of machines is that they serve as a supplement to soldiers on the ground and eventually, I can almost guarantee, will replace a lot of roles in the future. For instance, bomb control. The UGVs are suited to perform daily routine and fairly boring tasks with pinpoint precision and very good efficiency. They can be designed to withstand pressures and complete various tasks that could potentially harm or threaten the life of the soldiers, significantly improving the combat effectiveness of platoons, troops, companies, whatever it is, on the ground. The need for these vehicles was recognized very heavily by the United States after the Gulf War. Transformation of the army from heavy armor and firepower to a lighter, more responsive force capable of dealing that lethal damage, but also surviving adversaries' firepower, really did become a top priority. Development of these vehicles is a lot more complex though than a UAV, since they need to be able to traverse various trains and accomplish various different military assignments. UGVs can be classified really into four sections. Small robotic building and tunnel searching equipment, small unit logistic movers, unmanned wingman ground vehicles, and autonomous hunter killer team vehicles, such as the one you saw just now with the 50 caliber on the top. Two of the vehicles I'll focus on today are the smaller unit logistic movers and the autonomous hunter killer teams. The small unit logistic movers, also known as the donkeys, is a concept of supply weapons and even wounded soldier carrying, which could operate across any kind of battlefield space. Ever since the ancient times, logistics issues were one of the main concepts of successful battle. Ammunition, food, water weapons and various tools are needed by the soldiers in different situations. Sometimes this can be very difficult to do and carrying them by servicemen is really not the greatest time. But heavy loads can cause unwanted fatigue, resulting in negative combat effectiveness. The donkey UGVs are capable of providing solutions for those logistic situations. The vehicles are semi-autonomous, normally medium to large size, and carry a very large capability, normally of about a couple hundred kilograms. Benefits include lightening the soldier's backpacks, but also with good sensors it can follow the path of an active battlefield, thus really not depending even on remote controlled operators, it'll just follow you where you need to go. Fully autonomous donkeys could provide constant flow of supplies to soldiers, whether in urban, rural, or even any kind of terrain, without direct line of sight to the operators, rendering potential signal jamming completely useless. Now for me, on a personal basis, with the artillery, I think this thing would be fantastic for resupply. Why not? Have five or six of these things loaded up with 155mm rounds, punching back and forth to the fob, bringing up supplies instead of risking a truck, troops, or whatever else to go grab supplies, this thing could just go on its merry little way, bringing up tons of ammunition for the guns to fire. I think that is a key game changer when it comes to, you know, setting up a firebase, not having to worry about, you know, tons of ammunition being carried on the truck, potentially reducing the overall footprint that you're making when setting up a gun position. These things will just carry all the stuff for you. 
With the autonomous hunter-killer team concept, this is made around the idea that a couple of these things, or even sometimes five to ten of them in a sort of company level strength, can perform duties such as ambushing or actually just termination missions where you're sending these things out to go kill people. These things would pretty much be able to penetrate quite deep into the front lines and in any kind of battlefield condition, whether it be rough terrain or bad weather conditions and without risk to the troops, which in today's military climate, we really are siding for. We don't want to be involved in conflicts where troops have to be sent abroad to lose potentially their lives. Why don't we send 20 of these things in to do a mission that, uh, you know, a squad of 10 was going to do? It's going to save a lot of face to the governments that are using, you know, troops on the ground than using drones. Of course, drone comes with its own sort of, I guess, skepticism or problems because people say, well, if you're using a drone, you're still, you know, using a vehicle to kill people and you're not losing the human factors side of things and I get that but that's a whole different story and we're not going to talk about that today. The assignments that these things usually can have are pretty lethal especially if the unit though lacks the knowledge of the terrain and the conditions are highly in favor of the enemy these things are a lot more beneficial than having to send in troops on the ground. But in today's conflicts, especially in urban areas, it's quite hard to do a detailed reconnaissance of these areas despite the high-tech equipment, robots and machinery we have. Of course, these hunter-killer teams can operate day and night, reducing the need to bring extra night vision equipment, etc, etc. And of course, in any terrain or weather conditions, they are armed with really sophisticated sensors nowadays and some serious weaponry. We're talking about, you know, Mark 19s, 50 calibers, a lot of ammunition on board, being able to provide a lot of support firepower or just in general uh, an assault firepower that uh, you know, a section of troops would not be able to really carry with them. Bringing a 50 cal along on a section attack, yeah, that's, that's not a good time, but if this thing can bring it along with you, then yeah, why the hell not? The primary objective, though, when they design these kind of vehicles is high autonomy, meaning that they are not dependent on the human operator. Augmented intelligence and enhanced local networks between the UGVs in these teams are some of the biggest assets that they can have, which basically means the vehicles communicate with one another. You don't have to tell one to follow the other, it just does it itself, it just thinks. It already tells the other one what it needs to do because it's having a problem, for instance self-recovery. If one of these things gets stuck on a hill or in a ditch, the other one will tell, hey buddy, I need some help. He'll come down, hook him in, and pull him out. And that's that's what there's that's the next level of what they're getting into now. They know they can do self-autonomy, they know they can get these vehicles to go just about anywhere. But what about self-recovery? What about these things communicating with one another without the troops even have to worry about it? Of course, we're not gonna let the whole thing go into sort of Cyberline systems and Skynet and let these things just do their own thing. Someone's gonna be monitoring them. But it does make sense to have them work with one another and see what they can do uh, to, to provide support for each other instead of having to rely on the troops to say, Oh, looks like Simon's got stuck on a rock again. We're going to have to go get him. Oh, typical Simon. That's a pure Simon move, really. Um, I would name them Simon. I'm not too sure why. They this one looks like a Simon, like a simple Simon. Um, when these robots are released, though, they can usually assign targets and navigate through the train with ease. Um, but the human factor will be crucial when it comes to programming these machines. Of course, you are still operating a vehicle that could take a life, and it's not about just letting a robot do the dirty work for you. You've got to kind of think about that from a human factors perspective and what the government and what your people back in the countries that you're using these from are going to think about you using them. Because drones is a touchy subject around the world right now. The use of drones in conflict, yeah, it, it's touchy. In conclusion, the robotics of these systems are going to become a major trend in the future of warfare. Though the absence of the human factor can be useful in terms of better combat efficiency, less casualties, it is questionable if these robots are going to allow us to show our morals, war ethics, even mercy towards our enemies regarding them as, you know, targets than they are human beings. Because when someone's behind a screen using a joystick, is it is it different than being behind the trigger of your M4? But a rather interesting human factor that I find quite astonishing with these things is the fact that they will eventually start stealing job roles from people on the battlefield and a lot of soldiers, airmen, sailors, whatever it may be, may be a little bit upset about that. I must admit I'd be a little upset if my gun was taken over by a robot, it just drives out, fires a couple of rounds and comes home. I want to be on the gun. But that's what we could be looking at in the future and one of the videos I recently found which I thought rather hilarious was a casualty evacuation drill with a UGV and uh, safe to say the unit that are using it probably should be best using it because uh, well you'll see what I'm talking about when I fire it up let's take a look.
Okay, so before I go any further, I gotta admit that this vehicle is pretty cool looking. It's modular, can change things around, but folks, look at these gentlemen that are actually operating this vehicle. Do you see where I'm going with this? Why is it that these rather large fellows that, to be honest, really don't look like special forces operators are about to configure this vehicle differently? Let's find out why. Ah, it's making sense now. These special forces operators would much rather take the heavy duty UGV to carry their backpacks than anything else. Now, I have to admit, they haven't really picked the best actors for this particular scene being a small special forces, what I can only presume is special forces unit, going to recover a casualty from a rough terrain environment. Because that's what the video, video is really about, that's what the vehicle is about to do. Let's continue watching the video and I'll refer back to the point I'm trying to make shortly. Okay, so just a quick note about this particular scene. You have a UGV. It has a perfectly dry, flat, comfortable, probably able to carry all of your team's deck that you could sit on. Why on earth would you, as a team that's probably on their own, not utilizing that deck? Why would you not get on it, cross the river on it, and then get off on the other side? When you're waterlogging your equipment and your personal, you know, clothing like that, you're reducing the effectiveness, technically, of you as a soldier, because I can tell you this for sure. Running around in wet pants, wet webbing, wet tack vest, wet whatever, is not a good time, and it adds a lot of weight to your body. These gentlemen have decided, I'm just going to stroll across the stream. I understand that there's a tactical sense where they have to kind of, you know, cover their arcs, look around, whatever, whatever, but there's a gigantic UGV there. They know you're there. They can probably hear it, see it from a mile away, get on the deck, cross the river, and then get off on the other side. Reduce the fact that you have to get soaking wet. And I'm not too sure why this gentleman has just decided to perch his firing position literally in the middle of the river. He could have picked any other area that actually provides him cover and not soaking him all the way up to his muffin top that he has. But no, I'll just go in the middle of the river. It's very strange to me. It's just a very strange video. There is some serious tension on that buckle. Big guy, respect for you doing this. <laughs> I love it. This guy's sending a quick Snapchat. Just recovered casualty, heading home for tea and medals. <laughs> like, I know it's not what he's doing, but it looks like it is. See, now he's waterlogged and probably colder and less efficient at being able to run. I understand that getting wet is integral to being a soldier, but if you don't need to be, don't get wet. It's, you're taught that. Try your best not to get your equipment wet if you don't need to, and this is a situation where they really didn't need to. So they want to be all tactical and stealthy, yet they leave a smoke grenade behind randomly? What's that all about? Well, that's it for today, everyone. I appreciate you stopping by and watching today's video. I guess the moral of the story here is, are vehicles like this going to be effective? Are they going to be more utilized in the future? Do we think they're going to steal our jobs as soldiers, airmen, sailors, marines, whatever it may be? Hard to say. I think they do have a lot of capability to help out, but I think they also have the huge capability of producing quite a lot of problems and a hindrance. Um, thank you all for joining me on the video today. I really can't thank you enough. If you wish to support my channel, I would really appreciate you go check out my Patreon page. It is in the description box below. I also have a postal address now, so I have a P.O. box that uh, you can send me things to. I'm sure some of you are going to send me some real cringe stuff. Um, it'll be vetted, don't you worry about that. Um, but I, I really uh, would like to interact with you.
for you guys more. I know a lot of you have been asking to send me stuff, so if you wish to do that, you're more than welcome to. Go check out my link in the box below. Thanks again for joining me, folks. All the best, and bye-bye.